<laughs> All right, so good to be with you guys. Uh, I know y'all pray for me, so keep praying for me. I am, most of you do not know this, um, pastor knows, but I am the president of the local chapter of National Action Network, Sharpton's organization. Uh, and I am also about to be working uh, in a semi high level position with the police in Sacramento. Uh, so God is putting me in some very influential places, um, but I also gotta keep remembering how to navigate those places. So um, just be praying for me. And I'm grateful to our pastor who still pastors all of us. Um, and so uh, his guidance, his wisdom, as well as Reverend Breckenridge. So uh, just want to give you guys that quick little update because I know you all see me more consistently than most of Salem. So uh, remember me in your prayers in that space. All right, let's jump into uh, the word Mark chapter eight, beginning at verse 22. Mark chapter eight, beginning at verse 22. Oh, and I and I crashed on a motorcycle. See, my, uh, uh, yeah, it's a whole story. As yeah, but I survived. <laughs> the Lord, the Lord has kept me. Uh, you, 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 uh, might have been impressed, uh, Reverend Roby. I, I almost popped a willy, but not on purpose. <laughs> All right, Mark chapter eight, <clears throat> beginning of verse twenty-two, and I'm gonna read verse twenty-two through verse twenty-six. I'm reading from the Amplified, Mark chapter eight, verse 22 through verse 26. I'm gonna try to go through this at a brisk pace. Um, so I'm glad it's being recorded. So if you need to, you can go back and look um, and take notes and all those things. All right, Mark chapter eight, verse 22 through 26 says this, then they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he led him out of the village. And after spitting in his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? Verse 24, and he looked up and he said, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. Verse 25, then, Jesus, then again, Jesus laid his hands on his eyes and the man stared intently and his sight was completely restored and he began to see everything clearly. Verse 26, and he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Uh, I, I want to, uh, well, let's pray. Let's pray and then we'll get into it. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. God, we glorify you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this uh, space that you've allowed us to be in to hear from you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your everlasting mercy and kindness and grace towards us. We are grateful that you've allowed us to see this year and God, in spite of ourselves, our mistakes, our accidents, our intentional foolishness, you have been kind to us. And therefore, God, we have to conclude that you are still working things together for our good uh, because our hearts are toward you. So now, Father, in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, preach. Holy Spirit, you teach. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you say and show your church that we may forever be changed according to your will for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, so I don't usually do titles, but uh, I felt the title anointing for this one, Reverend Breckenridge. And so those of y'all taking notes, the title for our conversation tonight is, is Spitting Image. Spitting Image. Spitting Image. Um, most of us who are in church world, especially the preachers on here, probably heard of one of our fellow preachers on last week who who gave a very dramatic illustration um, to his church. Those of you that aren't aware of it, I won't go into too much detail about it. He's a, he's a good guy, so this is nothing against him. Uh, I think he just came up with something extreme and rolled with it, um, in which he basically was using the text in which Jesus spits in the man's eyes, and he literally did that in his message. He, spit in his hand and then he wiped that saliva on a man's face as an example. Um, and the world lost their mind. The church lost their mind. People, people from all over, people who ain't been to church in 50 years are like, you hear about the preacher that spit? I'd have punched him, I'd have done <laughs> uh, All kind of stuff exploded. And <clears throat> I think one of the things that set with me 
uh, as I prayed about and kind of considered, you know, Lord, how do you want me to encourage these folk on tonight? Um, and it was more a phrase that kept coming to my mind that it's not about the spit. It's not about the spit. Um, the term spitting image is uh, an allusion to someone who is so like someone else that they appear to have been spat from their mouth, right? The concept, the phrase uh, was in circulation all the way back in thinking like 1600s. Um, and some dude used it in a play uh, where he said, you know, poor child is as if his dad has spit him out. So it started back in the 1600s and it just kept building steam and stay with us. It also speaks on a deeper level to the fact that the spitting image speaks to the reality that a person is so like someone else that they share DNA, that the DNA in the saliva is what produced them. Uh, in many ways, you all, uh, we are the spitting image of God, right? And in theological terms, it would be the uh, Magio Dei, right? We are the image of him. Um, and I think oftentimes, it is encouraging to remember as we volunteer, as we serve, especially when you are serving behind the scenes, to remember this. Oftentimes stories navigate around lead characters, but I don't care how amazing a lead character you have, um, no, how big name the actor is, no story works without a supporting cast. No story even is believable, and check this out, if you don't have extras. Um, I have watched, uh, I watch a lot of movies and on one particular movie I was watching, they had, you know, deleted scenes and all these things. And one of the things was crazy because they showed the scene recorded, but without extras. And it was the weirdest thing ever. You don't know the extras name. You don't know where they come from. They don't have lines, but if you remove them from the movie, the movie no longer has weight. And so I want to encourage you guys tonight to, to know that even though sometimes it may feel as though you're simply an extra, God has specifically placed you where you are for a reason. And that reason is very simply because you're his spitting image. Um, when we look at the text, um, some, some, let's see how we put the fence around the particular text we read, starts around verse 11. In verse 11, it talks about, the, it says the Pharisees came out and began to argue contentiously and debate with Jesus, demanding Jesus a sign from heaven to test him. Verse 12, Jesus gets irritated, he rolls his eyes, he groans, he sends the sigh emoji. <laughs> uh, and in his spirit, he's just like, why do y'all always need a sign? Okay, I'm reading my version, right? He said, I assure you, and I promise you, if it's up to me, no sign is coming to this generation. Verse 13, he leaves them and then boards the boat and leaves for the other side. Uh, I think one of the things we have to consider as we roll into the text where Jesus spits in his hand is one of the things we notice in these verses is that Jesus prefers faith over facts. Jesus prefers faith over facts, okay? Now you look at verse 14 to 15, the disciples, now he's back in the boat, you know, the, the uh, Pharisees asking for a sign and prove himself. And Jesus is like, y'all tripping, I ain't doing all that. He gets in the boat with the disciples and the disciples had forgotten bread. They didn't bring, they didn't bring lunch. They only had one loaf with them. And <laughs> Jesus is saying, watch out, beware of the, leaven, the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, Jesus, y'all, is warning them of the potential of that present cultural doctrine to taint the truth of the kingdom. That's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about kingdom spiritual stuff. They not understanding that, right? But one of the things I want to encourage you guys is one of the things I think uh, Reverend uh, Terry mentioned this about the fact that you are in and among the congregation, you are among the people. It is very easy to become susceptible to the, the climate of the current culture when you're always in the people because you start hearing what they need. You start hearing their struggles. You start hearing their frustrations. You hear all these things. And a lot of times those things are shaped by the culture. Their expectations of the church, their desire of leaders uh, is shaped by what they see in the world. And sometimes you all, the church has been guilty, especially in America, 
that we've allowed cultural shifts to pervert sound doctrine. We, we begin to navigate around the preferences of folk um, as opposed to the call of the kingdom. Cultural shifts, let me give you some examples and we go, I'm gonna go briskly, but give you some examples. One thing, if you're taking notes, write this down, uh, personality popularity, personality popularity. I'm looking at cultural shifts, looking at the things, um, the, the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod, things that impact and can taint the gospel. Personality popularity. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, write it down and I'll read it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17 says this. So from now on, we regard no one from a human point of view, according to worldly standards and values, and read the Amplified. Though we have known Christ from a human point of view, we now no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ that is grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as savior, he or she is a new creature, reborn, renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual conditions have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. One of the issues with the Pharisees, you all, is they disliked Jesus because he was more popular than them. <laughs> uh, we have a culture now that personality and the popularity of personality is what so many churches are built on more than the gospel. Um, so here the Pharisees are trying to shift and change and maneuver because they're intrigued and they're intoxicated by Jesus's popularity. They have no real discernment though, and we're gonna get into it because they don't know him, what that popularity is really stemming from. So they're assuming it's personality. So they make, so Jesus is now making some suggestions about this, y'all need to be careful about this type of yeast. Uh, disciples, I need y'all to be careful not to get caught up in personality and popularity. And the question I want to ask you guys, this is encouraging, but it's also uh, something you should investigate for yourself, is do we want him because he's popular or do we want him because he's God and he loves us? Now, our immediate answer, my immediate answer is because he's God and he loves me. <laughs> but then we have to wrestle with the reality of the times we struggle when recognition is not given consistently. Times we struggle when we are not celebrated, the times we struggle. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with celebrating. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with recognition. Uh, I'm saying when we get in patterns where we are longing for certain types of attention as a result of what we do, we have to begin to ask, what do we want him for, okay? Um, one of the other issues that, that was going on is, and ha happens today, is the increased value of what we desire, the increased value of what we desire or what we see. Um, the Bible says for all that is in the world, the lust and sensual craving of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these don't come from the father, but they are of the world. This is what drew Adam in. This is what drew Adam in. <laughs> uh, Adam wasn't looking at no fruit. Adam was looking at Eve naked. He didn't need a lot of convincing. He had this fine presentation from the Lord that stood before him and said, here. Um, sometimes you guys, when we begin to focus our sights and our eyes on the wrong things that we desire, and it may not be wrong per se, but it just might not be the right season and the right time. It can begin to taint why we do what we do, why we serve, how we serve. I had a conversation with some young adults, um, not too long ago, and it was about abstinence. It was about abstinence and they were abstaining which I'm like, oh, that's great. That's amazing, especially today. Don't nobody do that no more. <laughs> that's amazing. So proud of you guys. Uh, but as the conversation went on, what I realized, Joan, is uh, they were abstaining in a bargain with God. It was, if I don't do this, you owe me a spouse. And they struggled with the revelation that that's not how God works. Um, and so their desire to be married is not wrong but it is shaping how they go about it. It is shaping, watch this, uh, it is inserting unhealthy leaven into the bread of their servanthood, okay? It, it is shaping their motivation. And so that's one of the things we have to be careful of is, is the desire in this current climate. 
Uh, another thing that, that messes up the bread, nothing messes up the bread. And this is what Jesus warned them that, look, y'all gotta, gotta, y'all gotta be careful. Uh, it is, it is a longing these days for, uh, how can I put it? Parades of intellect and deeper knowledge. <laughs> we, everybody won't be deep. Everybody won't be deep. I want to encourage y'all because many of y'all done lived a couple of lifetimes. You, you, you got wisdom. God has blessed you. Um, and you sometimes question and you look and say, well, I'm not, as, I don't do this and I don't know this. You ain't got to know all that. That is not what God requires of us. Um, if the Lord puts it on your heart to go back to school, by all means, go back to school. Uh, but don't you dare try to shift who you are and how you serve uh, because you feel like you have to be able to know certain words and you got to break down the Greek. You don't need to know all that to serve no communion. You, you, don't, you don't need to know that to love on somebody because when you visit somebody in the hospital, they don't care if you can exegete a text. Can you live the text? That's all they want to know. Can you be that? And so many of you have been consistently doing that. And I want to encourage you to stay in that space of being authentically who God has called you. When the Holy Spirit challenges you to go farther and stretches you, obey. But don't begin to try to push yourself to shift into something you're not. That's what drew Eve in. Adam, it was, you know, looking at Eve. Eve, it was information. <laughs> Satan said, I can tell you some stuff. I can share some stuff that God ain't told you. She's like, for real? And so we we have to be cautious of that. And Jesus is just kind of telling them, look, y'all, you know, this is the stuff that's messing up the bread. I want y'all to be mindful of it, be careful of it, because I'm not fooling with the Pharisees. They crazy. They're not about to push me into the popularity contest. I don't have to show them no sign. I ain't got to prove myself. So let's keep it moving. The disciples are like, but we didn't bring enough for sandwiches. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, but, you know, and she's like, I, what are y'all talking about? And this is where we begin to shift a little bit because one of the things that prevents us from being the spitted image of God is not just being influenced by culture, but it's also when we lack understanding of him. When we lack understanding of him. I cannot encourage you all beyond a million words to stay in your word, stay in your scripture. It is not a, I'm just a volunteer, or I just serve communion, or I just park cars. Or I, there is no, I just. Uh, you are as critical to the, the success of the kingdom as the one that stands in the pulpits, the ones that stand behind on TV screens. So and actually, you're probably more important than those of us that stand in front of the people, because again, you are living among the people. And that means you have to be in your word. You have to understand the Jesus that you serve. And you have to understand the Jesus you serve from your relationship with him, okay? Not mine. Uh, one, 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 of the, one of the things that happened, y'all, is um, the disciples got their mind stuck on the surface stuff. And they're trying to impress Jesus with the wrong thing. They're like, you know, but we can get some more bread. Just like, I don't care about the bread. <laughs> that's, that's not the point of it. And I don't want you all to ever get in a place, especially during this pandemic, especially when the world is crazy, where you, you begin to drift and try to push and, and do things that God has not called you to do. Just stay in, your, stay in your space that God has called you to and be okay in that space. One of the issues with churches today, you all, is that many leaders are not leading uh, because we are spending time trying to impress people. And one of the things I found even in my church, and this is between us, <laughs> well, actually, no, it's recorded, so it doesn't matter now, um, is a lot of my leaders that are faithful, I have some very faithful leaders, thank God, but some of them struggle because they are so busy trying to impress me that they're not leading. I, I don't, I didn't call you, God called you. Uh, Pastor Meeks didn't call you. Reverend Breckenridge didn't call you. Uh, Reverend Roby, they didn't call you. God called you. So I don't ever get caught up in, let me make sure Reverend Breckenridge sees I'm doing this. Or let me make sure Pastor sees I'm doing this. That, that's, that's not who called you. Be who he called you to be. And it's oftentimes when we don't fully understand who Jesus is, we falsely assume things will impress him that just simply don't. So as they're heading into Basada, Jesus is frustrated because his disciples are ignorant. He's like, y'all don't even get the stuff I'm talking about. <laughs> like, 
he, he's frustrated because the Pharisees trying to trying to punk him. The Pharisees trying to get him to do stuff. They pushing him to to be more ingrained in their idea of what he should be in culture than the disciples, the ones he's been with. He's explaining things to them from a spiritual standpoint, and they can only think of the natural standpoint. They're trying to impress him and missing him. Right. So when you get to the text, Jesus, as they enter Basada, is a little frustrated. And it, the scripture says, verse 22, it says, then they came to Basada and some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. Uh, Y'all, it will always be difficult to discern a move of God when we are ignorant of what moves him. Let me say it again. It will always be difficult to discern a move of God when we are ignorant of what moves him. So I submit to you all tonight for the time that we have is that we are his spitting image and to become the miracle workers we're called to be regardless of your title regardless of your place then we have to see the miracle worker that we are fashioned after the issue ain't spit <laughs> and hopefully it makes more sense as we go on they bring this man to jesus they beg him to touch him people are drawn to power or the illusion of power Say it again, people are drawn to power or the illusion of power. Power does not rest in titles. Uh, power does not rest in who appointed you. Now, there's some natural favor and stuff that comes when somebody says, you know, so and so is with me. Um, but power is not in that. Power is only found in the one we are fashioned after. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Timothy, my brother Quentin, Pastor Mumphrey, quotes this scripture almost every day. <laughs> Anytime something crazy in the world happens, uh, he's like 2 Timothy 3 and 1. Uh, but it says, in the last days, dangerous times will come for people be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, devoid of self-control, brutal, haters of good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. Avoid such a people. Stay far away from them. For among them are those who worm their way in the homes, captivate morally weak and spiritually people weighed down by the burdens of sin. The end days is full of people presenting an illusion of power. Now, where you all sit, you carry the ability to shift people's lives in such a way that it is not anything but God's power. The thing, the issue becomes in your positions that you always remember that God, I want you to use me for whoever is brought to me, whoever you brings to me. It is, it is, do the hurting have someone to be brought to? When it comes to Salem, the answer is unequivocally yes. Um, since I've been at Salem, which is all my life, uh, God has blessed our church to have an amazing, powerful army of volunteers. So that's not the issue. But the question becomes, as time goes on, and this is something for each of us to ask ourselves, the people God draws to you in your serving, are they drawn to your gifting or your anointing? Your gifting or your anointing? Pastor, what's the difference? One is all God, one is all us. It, it is very easy to then highlight the gifting because we feel like that's what people are drawn to. People may come in a room because you're gifted to sing. My aunt Lynette, uh, when she was alive, was one of the most amazing singers ever. And I'm not biased. I ain't saying that because she was my aunt. Reverend Breckridge, anybody tell you, Reverend Mixtape, she was an, sound like an angel. And people were drawn to her gift. But watch this. People will come to the gift to celebrate it, but people will bring their issues to the anointing. They, they, because when, when I'm going through, <laughs> I need the anointing on your life. Uh, when I'm going through, I need to know that there's a the hand of God is on you in such a way that the power that emanates from you is not out of your gift, but is out of the anointing of God on your life. Uh, when people come to us, are they being drawn by our heart or our showmanship? Um, 
it, it can be it can be something if you struggle with low self esteem and you're serving because we can become intoxicated by people's celebration we come intoxicated by people's response to our serving and so that's something to always remember and encourage yourself encourage yourself the bible says david when the when the folk talked about stoning him encouraged himself in the lord encourage yourself to tell yourself that you are enough for what god needs to do right you don't have to shape yourself into something else. You ain't got to be extra. You don't have to become Reverend Breckenridge. You ain't got to be Reverend Roby. You ain't got to be Reverend Meeks. You ain't got to be First Lady Jamel. Be you. <laughs> be and always be you. Because it's the thing. Anybody that is brought to you, God has ordained them to come to you. And he's brought them to you. If he wanted them to go to Reverend Breckenridge, they would have came to Reverend Breckenridge. And so you don't have to become a showman. You don't have to do extra. You don't have to make yourself more. Just be you, uh, whatever that looks like. If you got a bunch of old country stories from when you lived in Alabama, tell the stories. <laughs> I mean, tell the stories. If you, if if your your thing, you might stutter some. Rest in your stutter. Take take your time say tell your story if you crack jokes crack your jokes if you are a kind and sensitive person be the kind and sensitive person don't try to reconfigure yourself so that more people are drawn to you right uh, the scripture doesn't go on and tell us that there's a slew of people in the bible who come begging jesus for spit because <laughs> it, it ain't about spit and, and if we were to be uh, give you if I gave you a direct correlation, spit equals the, the method or the vehicle by which power and deliverance and healing is released through you. That that's irrelevant. God can change that up at any given day. So be you right. Uh, we don't need antics. We don't need our gifts highlighted. Uh, I want you guys to understand there is glory in every molecule of your being. When you and I yield to who God has called us and shaped us to be, when we step into the fact that we are the spitting image of our creator, then that means you understand every place you end up, whether it's the hospital, whether it's a bus stop, whether it's the back of the house of hope in some room because some lady been crying the whole service and nobody asked her why, but God put it on you to notice that she was crying and you asked, that, that, that's your space. And that's where you have to be who God has called you to be, whether it's uh, working in schools, whether it's uh, serving lunch to somebody, feeding the homeless, whatever your space is you cannot see yourself as an extra in the story but as a critical part of the story because there's a unique anointing on you that is not on someone else because you oh thank you holy spirit you and i are pieces of an unlimited god what that means is god can make every one of us just like him and none of us be just like each other and, and so you're trying to match another part of God that God never wanted you to match. He made you the part you are. All we got to do is yield to what he wants in our lives. It's not about a pressing past. It's not about a pressing remember. It's not about anybody knowing your name. Because I'm going to tell you this. I don't know anybody's name that's been an extra, but I bet you the studio knows. I bet you the director knows. I bet you the writers have an idea of who is on that set. And so that is what matters. That's verse 23, because I get stuck. Uh, taking a blind man by the hand, he led him out of the village. And after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? Um, couple, of, couple of things that's interesting about this. We consistently see Jesus taking people away from groups uh i don't know that it's a, a mistake in god's overall plan and it's just the same god that said you know i'll leave the 99 and go after the one the more you guys we see jesus is doing his greatest works they're not in large crowds he's pulling people away he's putting people out of rooms he takes folk from this crowd and he's consistently telling people that he does the most amazing thing for it. don't tell nobody he's uh which is a stark contrast to the current world. We won't tell everybody 
you know, if we pray for somebody and they headache go away, we are like, you know, I just pray for so-and-so they headache, you know, we, we doing whole videos. Now, I do think there's a space for social media and I'm not one of those, you know, social media is the devil. I don't think that. Um, I just think there is a balance and there's something to investigate into why Christ consistently is doing some amazing work in isolated places. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we desire to set people free or bind them to ourselves? Now, it's going to be a little challenging, but my point to that is this. If you struggle, and I don't know anyone on here that does this between you and the Holy Spirit. If we struggle with low self-esteem, if we struggle with insecurity, if we struggle with not fully knowing Christ, um, then we create our own identity. We'll get to it in a second. And so what ends up happening is we end up navigating to serve the same people who we feel celebrate us most. Um, the people who appreciate us. Um, and what ends up happening oftentimes, especially in the church today, is people get attached to a person and not Christ. Do we desire to be used by God because we want his will or we just want to be needed by people? You know, many of you serving now, you probably have served this long because you don't really want to be in front of people. You, you kind of like behind the scenes and, you know, you kind of be able to move and kind of move where you go. The question becomes, though, why did God allow you to be in that closet space? What is he calling you uniquely to do in that space? that directly attaches people to him. When you're visiting a hospital, and many of you have seen this, um, but you don't lean into it because you're like, should I do this? Should I pray? Should I do this? Should I, you know, what is the Holy Spirit leading you to do? The Holy Spirit is not going to lead you to go against the house that he's called you to. He's not going to lead you to do something that goes against the structure and order of the church. Uh, he's going to lead you, though, to step out on faith. He's going to lead you, though, to suppress you and reveal him. Spit ain't the issue. It's how we understand him and how we see ourselves in comparison to Christ that directly impacts how we handle the processes of the miraculous. Um, and what I mean by that is COVID... <laughs> is the longest miracle ever. Uh, how can I explain that to y'all? I fully believe God has authority over COVID. I fully believe it. And it's not a, it's nothing in me that doubts that. Uh, I also fully believe we have to use wisdom. Wisdom does not conflict with faith. Faith does not conflict with wisdom. It is a dance between faith and wisdom that is the process of the miraculous unfolding. I hope that makes sense. Uh, it is wearing your mask to lay hands on the sick. It is, again, great preacher. I'm not knocking him. He's a good dude. Uh, but it is using water as an illustration and not your spit. Uh, you know, and again, I get why he did. I, I get it. I get it. I get, I get the, I get the pressure. I get it. Um, but it is being okay in this process. Many times you guys will go and you'll pray for somebody and they don't get up out the bed <laughs> and you're like, Oh, my prayers don't work. Oh my God. And you become discouraged. And you know, you know, Reverend Breckridge now, nah, maybe you should have so-and-so pray for so-and-so cause it don't seem like God. And we may not say this. Many of us don't say it. We just say, well, you know, I can. And oh, well, you know, I, you know, can so-and-so go do, or oh, I can do this. And we go find something that has the least chance of disappointment. But the reality of you all is, is the miraculous work God wants to do through you all, has been doing through you, and will continue to do through you, are all processes. And Jesus illustrates this, I, I believe, intentionally when he lays hands on his brother and Jesus asks him, this, this is the crazy thing. Uh, what time is it? Uh, Jesus asks, do you see anything? Now, okay, y'all know, I, I, I gotta 
theological, philosophical mind sometimes. Certain things Jesus asks intrigue me. You're God. Why are you asking me? <laughs> Dude, and you're God and you just touch my eyes. So would this suggest Jesus lacked faith? Or is Jesus oh, in his yeah. divinity teaching a lesson to our humanity that there are processes at times? There are processes even in the private place because the man ain't in the village no more. He ain't around nobody. This ain't showing out for nobody. This takes that burden off. This is Jesus visiting somebody in Roseland Hospital in the middle of the night, nobody knows. Nurses don't even know he in the room. So it ain't about spit because Jesus has no reason to do antics because ain't nobody watching. He does this and then asks the question. He asked the man uh, by the pool, uh, you know, do you want to be, do you want to walk? <laughs> do you want to be made well? Well, duh. Jesus is never asking these questions for him. He's asking it for a point to us. The issue ain't spit, y'all. That anyone that's ever volunteered, we know. Sometimes you got to, especially any of us has ever volunteered at Salem. We love our church, but it is. Sometimes you got to make do with what you got to make do with. We got to figure it out. You got to piece something together. And if all I got is something as uh, uh, un unlikable as spit, if all I have is this prayer and all I got is this prayer to get out and my dentures is acting funny or I got a headache or the car is jacked up. All I got is this raggedy car to take this person to their doctor's visit. All I got is bus tokens to get them here. All I have is a small apartment that is not always clean because I can't always keep it spotless. But, you know, God told me to open it up for prayer or whatever. Case. If that's all I got, that's what I get. And you have to use what he's put at your access to initiate the process of the miraculous. God is not asking for us to evaluate the materials. He's just saying, do the work. I'll kick the process off. Uh, verse 24, uh, he said, he looked up and the man answers Jesus' question. He says, man, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. Um, one of the things I, I want to, eh, how can I say this? I think y'all get it. If you don't, just watch it again and I think the Holy Spirit will give it to you. Um, and if it don't make sense, Reverend Breckridge will tell me and I'll type out something. But when we can't see with our eyes, it is usually our imagination that sees with our memory. W what we can't see sometimes, when we can't understand something, when we can't grasp it, our mind imagines by filling in holes with our memories or our experiences. That's what shapes your expectation. That's what shapes our expectation. I wanna push and encourage you guys to increase your expectation so that when you go into these rooms, when you go into these places um, and you're serving and you're serving at the altar and you're serving even just administration, you're replying to emails. These places, if we are not consistently in communication with Christ to know him, to understand who we are fashioned after, we will be little moments and make them nothing when they're really greater than that. What do I mean? The man could see, but he couldn't see. It was blurry. We, and we'll, we'll see an opportunity, but it'll be blurry. And because it's blurry, we fill it in with what we remember, what we've experienced. The man compares moving people to trees, trees walking, which indicates that at some point in his life, he could see and he lost his sight. And for whatever reason, his mind recalls trees. And so he can see movement, but he can't identify with clarity what it is. And sometimes, you guys, you will falsely assume because you're not bishop or pastor, and this is just for some of y'all, uh, that what you're seeing is okay. It's not God's desire that even you operate with blurry vision. 
And so we will take moments where God has an amazing thing before us, and we will assume because of the title or lack thereof that our vision is what it is when really we're filling in holes where our expectation for that moment is now being shaped by the experiences of our past. So now you keep thinking about the last time you lay hands on somebody in the hospital and they weren't healed. And so now in this moment, though, God is clearly trying to show you an opportunity that somebody can be healed you see it blurry so you say okay god okay i'm gonna pray for you but you're not seeing with clarity that god wants them healed and so we lean into that moment with that expectation this memory of trees moving you go into um conversations with leaders and going conversations with ourselves not seeing clearly uh it jesus consistently says throughout the new testament it's their faith that made them whole uh, we have not fully grasped who Jesus is in our lives in the world when we can have blurred vision when it comes to the calling and the purpose of God in the moments that we find ourselves in. And some of you have been so hard on yourselves because you keep remembering all your blurred vision moments and you're assuming there's not yet another touch. You're assuming God has, has lifted or God has changed or you too old for this, or maybe my season is up or maybe it's time for me to shift gears. No, 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 mm -mm, nope, that, that ain't it. I suggest this y'all because again, Jesus has said constantly, their faith made them whole. He told the, move, uh, the man by the pool, he asked him, you wanna be healed? The man says, yes, Jesus says, gets up. He tells the lepers, uh, before they heal, go show yourself. And the Bible says, as they went, they were healed. The woman with the issue of blood, who without any prompting for Jesus, crawls through the crowd, touches him. Jesus says, who touched me? He says, woman, that faith has made you whole. The centurion, commanders, uh, his faith. He said, I ain't seen faith like this in, in forever. Whatever you want is done from, the, from this moment. It's done. The issue is not Jesus. It's our faith. And our faith has been blurred by facts. Facts are what look like trees. Um, there's, there's popular preaching, uh, and Reverend Breckridge tell you about it. Most of the preachers on here, Reverend Terry and I probably heard about it too. You know, preachers go through the whole, you know, there's a difference between facts and faith. And you know, we go through in facts and truth, and the you know, preacher goes through that, and everybody's, ah, we shout, and it sounds really good. Um, and then nobody puts it into practice. <laughs> uh, you are, we sometimes have blurred vision because we know more about those who led us to Jesus than Jesus himself. Um, I love my pastor. I do. He knows it. Him, him and I, I'm glad it's different when you get become like a grown son. My biological father, my dad, and I have different conversations now. And just like that, me and Pastor Meeks have different conversations now. So now I get to openly disagree with him on stuff uh, that I would have never done before. But it's, it's interesting, though, because his opinion used to drastically shape my worldview, which is normal when you're a baby in Christ. Um, but now it does not. Now I put his thought, his opinion up against what does the Lord say? What does the scripture say? What does the Bible say? Right now, I've never found an instance where I'm like, oh, my pastor, he crazy, he in error. And I ain't never had that. But it's, it's OK, how do I proceed from here? Because if I know more about Reverend Meeks than I know about Jesus, everything's going to always be blurry. Because, again, for Jesus, it's an issue of faith. Who is my trust in? Now, this man is blind. We don't even fully know if this man knew who they were bringing him to. Now, I'm sure they probably was like, this, this dude, Jesus, you know, he's been healing people. We're going to bring you to him. He's going to fix you right up. That's the extent of his knowledge for the most part. Now, Peter and them, I think, were from that city, from that town. So he probably knew like, oh, yeah, dude, you know, my, my three, my buddies, you know, they hang with dude. But he got the move on what they are taking him to. He's not yet experienced Christ. But you have, you have. How many things in your life has God brought you through? Um, he brought you through them, huh? not to put you on a, in a pulpit, but to put you in a person's life. Mm -hmm. he, he, he's brought 
uh, Nikki through things. He's brought Joan through things. He's, he's brought you all through these places so that you accumulate experiences. Watch this. Not so the experiences shape how you see the future, but so that you see your future through how he's brought you through the experiences. The first touch, ooh, thank you, Holy Spirit. The first touch is Jesus giving the man his first experience with him. So now the man can be like, dang, dude just touched me with something because it ain't about spit. It ain't about spit. He just touched me with something and I can kind of see. He might be on to something. And many times you guys, we have to be careful because our memory does not always translate to the current reality. So God may send resources for your business, but because you can't see, we see the money as play money. Uh, God, God can send you someone um, as a friend, a kingdom friend to build kingdom with, but because we can't see clearly, we see them as a lover. Uh, God can touch us to serve others, but because we can't see clearly, we see others as potential fans. God is saying, I, I did some touches. It might be a little blurry, but I don't want you to fall back on history. I want you to look at my patterns with you. Look at what I've done in your life. Don't let your memories of, of trouble and turmoil and pain fill in these blanks. Because when you know me, you know I would not do that to my spitting image. Verse 25, uh, then again, Jesus laid hands on his eyes and the man stared intently and his sight was completely restored and he began to see everything clearly. Uh, it's, not about, it's not about spit. It, it's about focus. It's about focus. Um, during 2022, what are you staring intently at? What are you focusing on? Is it simply just to serve to say you've served? Is it simply to volunteer because that's what you've done for so many years? Or has God placed something before you? Then now he's saying, okay, this has been blurry, but now it's time for you to focus. Now, now it's time for you to, 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 to stare intently. As his spitting image, we should be able to imagine what we have never seen without seeing our past. 2021 is over. 2020 is over. <laughs> 1998 is over. I, it's, it's, it's over. You've been lost that job. The relationship been over. That your kid been done that. You you you've been had glaucoma. You've been you you've been doing you, you've been here. Okay, your arthritis ain't been healed. It ain't been healed. What's the focus this year? Because we cannot let Jesus become the habit. Can't let him become the habit. After after uh Jesus does this, we <laughs> I think God says to many of us, I want you to be patient in the processing of miracles. And I know you all are all serving other people. And I kind of been talking about this in the context of you being used to do the miraculous in other people's lives. But I really believe the Holy Spirit is saying to some of you, be patient in the process of you as miracle. Be patient in the process of you as miracle. Um, because many times y'all miracles and being used by God and serving God isn't a camera phone, it's a Polaroid. It, I know y'all know Polaroids. Don't be looking at me like, okay, I know y'all know, I ain't talking to the young adults. I know, I'm, you know how I know I'm catching up with y'all because I'll be saying stuff in church sometime and when my young adults, my 20 something stuff, and they'd be looking at me like, what are you talking about? Uh, they were like, what? Uh, I mentioned, uh, uh, Reverend Brickridge, I mentioned uh, trading places, Eddie Murphy. And I mentioned that one time. They looked at me like, oh, are, you, are we switching service today? Like, are you, are you, <laughs> they thought literally, I meant, they, they, so anyway, 
I, I, I get it. So, but my point is, <laughs> it's Polaroid. It's, it's sometimes this process of you take the picture and then, I don't know why we shook the things. I don't know if they, did they ever say you had to shake it? Yeah, we, I don't know why we started shaking them things. Uh, and, we, and we shook it trying to get the picture to, and it took a second and then it, and then it showed up. Um, because there's something genuine in the evolution that occurs in a process. And so I want you to be patient with yourself in that space. It, it, Jesus says, after he does all this, <laughs> he looks at the disciples, he sends the man away, he says, don't tell nobody. And now watch this flow. Pharisees get on his nerves and they trying to push him because you know they they all culture they just trying to push them into this whole thing jesus looks at the disciples like yo we can't fall for the banana and the tailpipe we not we not that's not how we're wired i don't want you all to allow this to change how you serve i don't want this to allow you to change how you volunteer because really the disciples are volunteers ain't none of them paid um <laughs> I, I i i don't want this to change how you volunteer right and the disciples are like man we got to impress jesus because you know he he you know he may not let us go to the hospital visit no more he might not ask us to pray no more you know so uh you know jesus we got some bread and jesus is like oh why do y'all not get it uh <laughs> let me let me illustrate something then he, he he takes this man the man is brought to him and he spits and it's nasty and it's uh, you know he touched the man's eyes and man you know and his process evolves in front of them now this is the crazy thing before he heals the man he's frustrated because the disciples don't understand nothing after he heals the man, the next thing he asked them is, who do people say I am? Because John, what he's asking, what he's asking Reverend Roby is, once again, I have demonstrated something to you, an illustration, right? And now he's saying, what do you see? And the disciples' initial answers show that their vision is still blurry. They see him, but they see him as a tree. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say, some say you're this, some say you're that. Uh, I see you, Jesus, but you look like the one who brought me to you. Uh, I see you, but you look like my favorite preacher. I see you, but you look like the road to fame. I see you, but you look like my history. But Peter gets a revelation. Uh, it's not about spit, y'all. And I know it gave you a lot of questions to ask yourself, and I pray it encourages anybody that listens to it because it's not about spit. It's not about the vehicle. Um, it's about us being the spinning image of him. And in being his spinning image, it is knowing and understanding him so much so that we can navigate the isolated process of miracles in the places don't nobody see you, in the places nobody celebrates you, in the places, in, in the places you are misunderstood. <laughs> it, it, is, it is being able to sit in that place, Kim, and be like, I see you, God. I see you. And so the question I'll leave you guys with is 2022, as a spitting image of him, what are you looking for? What are you intently staring into in your role in the kingdom? The enemy would love for you to belittle what you do. But I promise you, you have power, authority, glory wrapped up in you that you've not tapped into yet. Because often we are comparing ourselves to the environment we're in and not who sent us there. So that, that, that's, that's, that's it. I pray and encourage you. Uh, let's pray. And then if you have questions, um, I'll answer them. I think Reverend Breckridge is going to stop the recording after we pray. And so those of you who have questions, if you want to stick around for a second and ask those, I would love to answer them. But let's pray. Father, we bless you, God. We glorify you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your revelation and opening our eyes to see and our ears to hear. 
Uh, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would allow it to sit in our spirits, that we we would remember that we are the spitting image of you, but it's not about the spit. It's, It's about knowing you, understanding you, and then living that out. Whether people see it, whether people don't, in spite of the pressures of culture, um, in spite of our own weaknesses and flaws, Lord, we wanna be able to see you more clearly. So Father, if that requires another touch in this process that you're doing in our lives, then we welcome that. And we will stare intently focused in on you that we may uh, experience you all the more and all the new in this year. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that this would be not cliche, but the greatest year of their lives. And greatness is not defined, Lord, by the lack of struggle or the lack of pain, but greatness, Father, defined by us overcoming. Greatness defined by us stepping into who you called us to be. Greatness is defined by us being used to do amazingly powerful, miraculous things in your name and for your glory that men and women all across this world will begin to say, who is this Jesus? Because he surely has some power. And so we glorify you now. I thank you. Um, In Jesus' name we pray.